Hello, and welcome to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. Each year, the prestigious Beverly Alt Scholarship provides senior fellows at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre in Sydney an opportunity to enrich their educational and career training activities. This fellowship honours the life of Beverly Alt and the compassionate care she received at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. As such, our very own Dr. Josh Hurwitz abandoned me to go gallivanting in the United States of America. He was able to attend the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in Texas as well as engage with some of the brightest minds in cancer care and research at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Meanwhile, I was left to freeze in one of the coldest Australian summers on records. No, I'm not bitter. Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, supported by the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and the Beverly Alt Scholarship, is incredibly honoured to present a series of interviews with specialists who have influenced the course of medical oncology on both a global and personal scale, providing the promise of innovative, personalised medicine. In this episode, Josh interviews Dr. Erica Mayer. Dr. Mayer graduated from Harvard Medical School and spent time at Brigham and Women's Hospital before completing her training at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, which she joined as a senior specialist in 2006. She is currently the Director of Breast Cancer Clinical Research at Dana-Farber and brings unparalleled expertise to both research and patient care. Welcome back to another episode of Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. As you probably are aware, I am sitting here with Dr. Erica Mayer. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. So this is the first of a series of breast cancer clinician interviews that we're doing. And I think the way we always like to structure these interviews is kind of understand your drive and understand your history. So Erica, if we head a little bit into your past, can you tell me a bit about your journey of getting into medicine, oncology, and really finding your niche in breast cancer. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I'd I'd love to take it back a a few years. (laughs) So um, I, like many physicians, I grew up with a physician as a parent. My father is a medical oncologist as well. And so I I grew up around medical oncology and used to visit uh, with him on rounds and knew the kind of work he was doing. So I always found that really interesting. When I got into medical school, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Everything looked great. And I trained in internal medicine thinking I was going to be a gastroenterologist, actually. But around the time that I was an intern in medicine is when the very first targeted therapies came out in oncology, specifically Gleevec. And all of a sudden, we had this pill that you could use to treat cancer. And it it just seemed like the dawn of a whole new world of how we were going to take care of this disease. It was really exciting and it looked like such a great combination of discovery in the lab and something you could do for patients. Plus, I I think for many of us in oncology, we love the longitudinal relationships and um, the the way that you can provide so much benefit to people. So even though I I tried at times not to do the same thing my father was doing, I couldn't help myself because the field is fantastic. So um, came and trained in in medical oncology. And when I was a fellow, I had the wonderful opportunity of having the most amazing mentor, Dr. Eric Weiner, who I I think you know. And um, he has been a mentor for many, you know, over over decades, but he's just an absolutely amazing person and took me under his wing. And um, and that's how I put down my roots in breast oncology. It's it's always a very interesting story that a lot of people when they find their niche. It's about the people they know and their experiences within the field. And I'm assuming you probably don't use Gleevec anymore. <laughs> and so you you jumped into breast cancer and what made you lean towards, I guess, a research-based pathway? And I know Eric obviously is very big into the research, but even he started in the, the private world and sort of jumped across. Can you tell me a bit more about that sort of journey for you? Well, um, I did my fellowship at Dana-Farber and Dana-Farber is a a hospital with a dual mission of discovery and clinical care. Everything we do at the Farber is designed to maximize that balance. And so when you train there, when you practice there, 
um, it's in some ways expected that not only are you providing the best possible clinical care, but you're also doing everything you can to move the field forward, whether that's in laboratory-based research, clinical trials research, outcomes research. So every single person who, who we work with at Dana-Farber is involved in research in, in some way. And part of my training as a medical oncologist was not only how to take care of people with breast cancer, but also how to put people on trials how to design trials, how to get a trial through the IRB, how to be the PI of a trial, how to present a trial to a patient in clinic and um, describe what the trial's about and have that patient share your excitement and enthusiasm for the research question. So that, that's that been part of my training all along and something which is fundamental to how I practice medical oncology and, and how I am a breast cancer oncologist. Yeah, it seems that you can hold a lot of hats. Um, and at the moment, my understanding is that you head up the, I guess, the trials or part of the trials department at Dana-Farber with a focus on sort of the phase one and phase two trials. Is that correct? Well, I'm I'm our director of clinical research in breast cancer. So I oversee our entire breast cancer clinical trial research program. And we have phase one, two, three trials that we either lead or we participate in. And we have a, a very large infrastructure of amazing research managers and research coordinators who help behind the scenes to make this all happen. So we, um, at any point in time, have about 50 trials that are open and enrolling patients um, for all subtypes of breast cancer, all stages of breast cancer. Many of these are industry trials where we have um, sponsorship from our industry partners, but we also have a large number of investigator-initiated or collaborative trials that are generated out of our own observations in the clinic or in the lab. And then we participate very intensely with uh, the cooperative group trials through the Alliance or other U.S. nationally based research groups. Okay, that sounds like that sounds like a lot of work, but also very interesting. And apologies about the faux pas of being the head. You know, the, the hierarchy is always a unique, unique world. Tell me a little bit about the the Palace trial. So this is one of your you were the PI on this trial, and you know you sort of drove it. But for those that sort of don't know, can you sort of give us a brief overview of sort of this and how how you were inspired to I guess start this? Yeah. So. Um- During the 1990s and 2000s, there was the development of CDK4-6 inhibitors, so targeted therapies to halt the cell cycle. And I remember very distinctly, December 2012, we were at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, and our colleague Rich Finn from UCLA presented a uh, phase two randomized trial in metastatic hormone receptor positive disease, randomizing people to get letrozole alone or letrozole with one of the CDK4-6 inhibitors, palbocyclib. And it it was very dramatic. People who got the palbocyclib did much better in terms of prolonging progression-free survival. It was like a doubling in progression-free survival. And we all looked at this data and thought, here's the future for hormone receptor positive disease. Seeing that generated a whole flurry of subsequent trials in the metastatic setting, both the industry trials, the Paloma 2, Paloma 3, that led to the FDA approval of palbociclib in 2015 for advanced hormone receptor positive HER2 negative disease. Back to 2012, not long after that data was presented, I sat around one of the round tables in San Antonio with our colleagues at Pfizer who make palbociclib and um, myself and and my mentors at Dana-Farber, and we pitched a trial to do a a pilot adjuvant trial to try adding palbociclib earlier to early stage patients for a two-year course to see, can you do it? Can patients take this? Is it tolerable? Is it feasible? And so we worked together and it became an investigator-initiated trial that we led presenting data in about 2017, showing that although there are the expected side effects that we see with palbociclib, people could do it. They could take a two-year course. What we learned from that experience led to the design and development of PALACE. And PALACE was a really unique trial um, that began to be designed in sort of 2013, 2014. And it, it is a true collaborative trial. It is a collaboration between our European colleagues led by the Austrian Breast Cancer Study Group, ABCSG. Michael Gnant is the head of that group, who is an absolutely wonderful guy. And in the US, led by Alliance Foundation, which is part of the um, Alliance Group for Clinical Trials, used to be CLGB. And I was a PI for for, uh, Alliance Foundation, AFT, in addition to collaboration with the US cooperative groups, PRECOG, 
um, with Angie D. Michelle as the PI from Precog and NSABP. So a real global collaboration. And we had phone calls um, kind of every two weeks for years designing the trial. We all sat around the virtual table together, our, our academic representatives, our industry representatives, and we created this trial. And it, it has really been an amazing process. Through that collaboration, we were able to do some really groundbreaking aspects of clinical trial design. For example, as part of the eligibility for PALIS, there was a requirement that a patient had to submit a tissue block. So we mandated tissue block submission for what ended up being close to 6,000 patients who entered the trial. Wow. So we have a, a European biobank, we have a US biobank, and um, and 6,000 samples. We have tens of thousands of struct tubes for ctDNA. So we established an enormous biorepository for the trial, and that was baked into the original trial design, which at the time, no prospective trial in breast cancer of that scale had ever required tissue submission. So we were able to do a lot of really revolutionary things. Palace reported at ESMO September 2020, right in the middle of COVID, there was an uh, interim analysis where a futility boundary was crossed, meaning that the addition of palbocyclib to adjuvant endocrine therapy did not improve progression-free survival. And this is in contrast to the results we have now from Monarchy with abemocyclib, um, from Natalie with ribocyclib. So unfortunately, Palace was a negative trial, although a, a very important clinical result that, that we all needed to know in order to know how palbocyclib would play out in all of our clinical settings. Since the original presentation, we are up to, I think, at least a dozen presentations, publications, and we are very excited to have the first of our TransPalace data presented at San Antonio this year, looking at genomic analysis of those 6,000 tumor blocks. So we have a tremendous amount of work that we can do with our biorepository and just to learn about contemporary management of hormone receptor positive disease. So it, we will continue to present a lot of data from that trial. And, um, and we still have our phone calls every two weeks, 10 years later. <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. And also make some good colleagues and some good friends probably along, along the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. And it, it, you, you said a couple of things which are really interesting, you know, pelbocyclin, the, the forefront of the CDK world, you know, it revolutionized hormone receptor positive breast cancer and your trial, although negative, almost revolutionized or kind of pushed the treatment earlier on, which we're seeing in a lot of spheres. Was there any discussion about, and no one's been able to answer this, and I'm very happy if I can cut this out, about why pelbocyclin just didn't have the same outcomes as, let's say, ribo or abemocyclin? Because from a tolerability perspective, pelbocyclin is always the winner. Right, right. It's a very well-tolerated drug. And I think based on our experience in the metastatic setting, we understand the toxicities very well. You can mm. anticipate neutropenia, you can manage it. It's not dangerous for people. No. Um, and because of that tolerability, people do have the ab ability to take this drug for years. And I have a collection of patients in my practice who started palbocyclib for metastatic disease back in 2015 when it was approved, and they're still on it mm. and they're doing great. And they tolerate it you know, with dose reduction, fine. So, you know, I, I think we don't know why of these three trials, two were positive and one was negative. It, it has led to a reexamination of CDK4-6 inhibitors that even though they are all in the same class, they're not all identical and they have different um, uh, specificity and um, uh, ability to block the different CDKs, whether it's 4, 6, 2, you know, the, the other ones, it's, the, there can be different resistance pathways that come up with these drugs. So what we might be seeing is just the differences among the three agents, and they're mm. not all the same. I, I think that, you know, all of the adjuvant trials were extremely well run and, um, you know, patients were cared for very carefully. In Palace, we did see a, a fairly high level of discontinuation, mostly for neutropenia. Um, and in the, in the beginning, we thought, could the results be because people didn't complete the two years or they had so many dose reductions? But we did a very careful analysis of the palace population and showed that whether you stopped early or you were able to continue, it didn't seem to influence the ultimate outcome. So we don't think it's because people couldn't take the drug properly. So, you know, I don't think we have a good explanation for this, but I, I will say personally, I'm grateful that we have 
positive results from the other studies, and we are able to bring this into the clinic and offer this to patients. Yeah, it has revolutionized the adjuvant sphere. And we, even here at the Kinghorn, we have a group of patients that are still going and yeah. they've been on it since the early trials and we see them every couple of months and they're happy and we're happy and it's a great, great kind of success story in a modern oncology world. And I think, tell me a bit more about this biobanking. So for those that are uninitiated, biobanking is becoming this huge envelope of, I guess, information for clinicians, researchers, and for patients to kind of look at treatments. How are you guys utilizing that biobank? And obviously you can't give me the San Antonio results, although I love a, I'd love an early release, but uh, tell me what you're doing with this biobanking and how you're going to sort of structure it. Yeah. So the, the Trans Palace, so the sort of translational yeah. part of Palace is run by a very structured steering committee. And then there's sort of a Trans Palace group who also meet regularly and discuss the status. And we have a variety of biospecimens, including uh, paraffin tissue blocks and ctDNA, as well as other serologic samples. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot there. I think, honestly, with so many people involved, it's a little harder or slower to sort of move things along because there's a lot of folks. But what's been very nice about Transpalis is that there are many opportunities as part of that program for some of the really up and coming um, investigators who are developing a lot of specialty in the fields of tumor genomics or ctDNA profiling to take leadership roles within Transpalis and lead and guide a lot of the work that's being done. And I think, you know, over the next few years, as this data comes out, you're going to see some real rising stars in the breast cancer world um, having these leadership roles in terms of data management. So we're, we're thrilled that this has been a, a great way for kind of future leaders to, to become leaders through this work. Um, and then, you know, in terms of biorepositories, I think what's unique is that because this was done as part of a collaborative trial, we had the enormous benefit and support from, from our industry partner, Pfizer, in helping establish the, the bank. At Dana-Farber, we run a uh, large metastatic cohort called Embrace, um, which is for all of our patients with metastatic breast cancer. And we collect tissue and we collect blood and we bank it. And we are you know, beginning now to really reap the benefits of this and be able to ask questions to what is now a very large cohort. But in contrast to Palace, which you know, has this collaborative funding, um, Embrace and many other institutional cohorts that exist like this require philanthropic support or grant support. It's very hard to get adequate support to create and then interrogate these uh, these cohorts. And so, you know, I, I think for all of us who work hard at generating research funding and, you know, and try to get grants for our institutions, you know, putting it towards support of the creation of these types of cohorts is really important. Yeah, and it will pay dividends in years to come for mm -hmm. patients and hopefully your researchers as well, but predominantly patients and understanding the disease better. Where do you see the landscape of CDK4-6s in the future, like next generations? Is there any whisperings in the world of the medical oncology research landscape that sees what might be next? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for many of our great drugs, we, we get the first generation of them. And then we start working with second or third generation that can kind of blow out of the water whatever came first. And I think we're seeing this with um, antibody drug conjugates. We're seeing this with PI3 kinase inhibitors. And we're also seeing it with CDK4-6 inhibitors. You know, with the scientific knowledge of the cell cycle and all of the different CDKs, there's a whole wave of new agents that are targeting you know, one of the CDKs or multiple CDKs that are right now in clinical trials, some of which have shown some really exciting results. So I think in the future, we will perhaps eventually have a whole new cohort of drugs that we're using that are, you know, perhaps more specific for the CDKs themselves, or if let's say you could identify the resistance mechanism. So let's say, um, a patient is receiving a standard CDK4-6 inhibitor, their disease progresses, you interrogate the tumor, there's overexpression of cyclin E or CDK2. You could then pick a different CDK4-6 inhibitor that goes after that particular resistance mechanism and then find a way to sequence the drugs. So I, I think that the next wave will be these new generations of agents that are um, much more uh, potent and precise and um, that we can use in a very specific way with the patients. Yeah, the targeted future of oncology. That's uh, 
I think that's what all of us, all of us junior junior specialists and trainees cannot wait to do because <laughs> chemotherapy can be that backbone that we no longer really have to rely on exactly as much exactly changing tact slightly because I know we have limited time and I could sit here for hours just getting you to talk at me which I love you do a lot of work in the the sphere of pregnancy and breast cancer and I feel you know breast cancer in itself is such a challenging field but pregnancy and breast cancer probably doubles those doubles the stakes having very limited experience in, in this field I'd love to sort of get your take on how you manage it and you know the safe trimesters to give chemotherapy and what your approach is when dealing with someone who comes in with well, unfortunately a cancer likely in their very young years with while being pregnant yeah so our our patients at dana farber tend to skew younger um, much of that is related to the wonderful work from my colleague ann partridge who runs our young women's cohort so you know within a younger population of patients you do occasionally see this collision between breast cancer and pregnancy and especially nowadays as many women are um, having their first or later pregnancies in their mid to late 30s or even early 40s, that is a time when the rates of breast cancer begin to go up. And so we are seeing with increasing frequency uh, breast cancer being diagnosed in people who are pregnant. And having seen this a few times in the clinic when I was in training, I, I was really interested in, you know, how do we manage this? Um, and I think the, the, the deep challenge here, it's almost an ethical challenge, is that our job as medical oncologists is to do our best treating our patient, curing their cancer, giving them the best possible treatment. And our, our patient is the mother in this situation. But then you have this second patient, you have this developing fetus, and they're also going to be exposed to potentially whatever you're offering. So when you are coming up with your treatment plan, you have to actually think about both of these you know, people um, and how your your decisions are going to impact both of them. And what we find is that when you're trying to put together a treatment plan, um, you want as much as you can to adhere to our modern standards of care, our most contemporary management. But when a patient is pregnant, there's always an element of compromise. There's always something that is a little bit different. And so our job is to figure out, well, how far away from our standard of care would I need to deviate to effectively treat this patient and how important or not is the compromise. And so what we find is that each woman's treatment plan becomes highly individualized because we need to think not only about her cancer, her subtype, her stage, her presentation, but also where in the pregnancy is she, what trimester, how is the pregnancy going, um, what are her goals, um, you know, any obstetrical history we need to know about. So we have to try to put that all together. And treating breast cancer in pregnancy is really the ultimate multidisciplinary situation because, you know, we already do a lot of multi-D care with mm. surgery and radiation oncology, but now we have to bring in our maternal fetal medicine colleagues yeah. who actually, you know, are just incredible doctors. And it becomes really fun in a way to bring them in and try to put the pieces of the puzzle together to make the treatment plan. Um, we Several years ago, we established a prospective cohort where we collected data on the management and treatment of our patients with breast cancer and pregnancy. And we've had several publications come out of that experience, which have helped us and hopefully others with um, coming up with sort of standards of care. What we find is that there are some aspects of our standard breast cancer management that for the most part, we, we can do pretty seamlessly. For example, surgery. We can do surgery for breast cancer patients who are pregnant in any trimester. There's a kind of a myth that you can't operate in the first trimester, but you can. Mm. And um, we can do uh, lumpectomy, mastectomy. We can do sentinel lymph node biopsy. We can do immediate reconstruction. So really anything you would offer a patient normally, you can do this in pregnancy. And also, as you alluded to, we can give chemotherapy in pregnancy, not in the first trimester, but in the second and third. And we can give our usual AC. We just recently had a publication showing that we can safely give taxanes. We can give growth factor support. So we can give many of our regular chemotherapy regimens. So that part all works out well. The challenges, though, is that there are other aspects of what we do that we can't offer that are increasingly important. HER2-directed therapy, we can't do that in pregnancy immunotherapy. We can't do that in pregnancy. At least we don't have any supportive data. And so those are the situations where we do find ourselves making compromises. And so, for example, a, a classic situation is a patient comes in with uh, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, a patient for whom you would normally be giving preoperative 
HER2 directed therapy? How do you manage that situation? Um, that patient, you can still get preoperative therapy if we start in the second trimester, but you can't give the HER2 therapy. So we usually give a C, T, deliver the baby, and then add in the HER2 therapy. Um, and, you know, before moving to uh, eventual surgery, that the compromise there is the delay. The compromise is that they may get more chemotherapy, at least with weekly taxol, than you would otherwise. But they are getting in everything they need to get in. Um, and, you know, one part that we have worked really hard to um, uh, kind of educate about is that if you look over the old literature for treating breast cancer in, in pregnancy, there was a tendency to try to deliver the baby early, like get the baby out early and then give the therapy. But we know that a premature delivery is it's actually very dangerous for a baby. There's much higher rates of pulmonary complication, have to go to the NICU, um, and it's actually safer to leave the baby in until term and give chemotherapy and then have a term delivery with a safe and healthy infant. So we, we work really hard to try to make sure that the delivery is as uncomplicated and, and um, non-premature as possible. Um, so, you know, I think one other aspect is that um, there is always the option for, or, or often an option for a patient to terminate if that's what they wish to do. It's not necessarily something that we encourage as part of our discussions. Our discussions are more around how to effectively treat the breast cancer. But that's a complicated topic to talk about with patients, particularly in the United States nowadays. And here's where we are very grateful for our MFM colleagues who help to guide many of those decisions and, and um, help to work this through with us. But um, particularly for patients who have a desired pregnancy and want to keep the pregnancy, we you know try really hard to effectively treat their breast cancer and give them the best possible breast cancer outcomes while also allowing them to continue and complete a healthy pregnancy. Wow, that's, that's, that is so complicated. I, ha I have a question for someone who has limited experience in this. Patients who want future pregnancies or future kids, you know, chemotherapy is known to sort of push people into that postmenopausal phase of their life irrespective of their age. Can you give things uh, to suppress the ovaries during sort of their chemotherapy? Does that impact, you know, baby development? Or how do you manage someone who they might be young, they've only got one kid, maybe they want one, two, three, maybe more children. What What's sort of your process with that? Well, um, uh, again, I'm very grateful for my colleague, Ann Partridge, who you know, many years ago recognized how important this is for people mm. and um, established guidelines and pathways for a young patient newly diagnosed with breast cancer in terms of fertility preservation. Um, and it, it is very important if you take care of young patients to have access to a reproductive endocrinologist who can see a patient expediently and um, take them through a cycle of IVF with either egg or embryo harvesting and preservation um, if that is of interest to that patient. Um, and so for many years, that that's what we do. But um, we also have data from a, a clinical trial called POEMS that looked at using um, ovarian suppression with an LHRH agonist during chemotherapy, showing um, that people who use this were much more likely or significantly more likely to be able to get pregnant afterwards compared to those who didn't. And so that's a technique I actually use very frequently in clinic with my young patients. Um, you know, certainly we do IVF if that's what is of interest to them. But for many people, I will just do the LHRH agonist during the chemotherapy treatment. Um, so that's those are some of the strategies to preserve fertility. The flip side of that is, so you've had breast cancer. Can you get pregnant afterwards? And um, it's a very interesting literature to look at how this has been studied. The um, majority of initial efforts to do this are observational trials because you, you you can't run a randomized trial to flip a coin and say, you know, you breast cancer survivor get pregnant and you don't. Um, <laughs> no. But looking at observational studies uh, in a case cohort manner where you take your cases of people who chose to get pregnant and you try to match with controls shows a very interesting observation, which is the people who choose to get pregnant, particularly with hormone receptor negative disease, seem to do better. And it's curious, you, you, you sort of wonder, well, why would they do better if they get pregnant? And some people have said, well, maybe there's something about the hormonal milieu of pregnancy that might fight breast cancer. Um, probably more likely is something called the healthy mother bias, which is that even though 
in those trials, there's efforts to match cases and controls. There's probably something unmeasured around the people who choose to get pregnant versus those who don't that might uh, relate to some degree of risk. So, um, but for whatever reason, when we have particularly a hormone receptor negative patient who says, I'd like to get pregnant, we can turn to that data and feel reassured that there's no signal that it would create an adverse outcome compared to someone who chose, chooses not to. The, the challenge though is more for the hormone receptor positive because nowadays with extended duration adjuvant endocrine therapy, we might have someone on you know an endocrine agent for a decade afterwards. And that covers many of the years of fertility for the younger patients. So um, my colleague Ann Partridge and, and others in the breast cancer community led a, a really groundbreaking clinical trial recently called the POSITIVE trial that um, enrolled patients who had a history of hormone receptor positive breast cancer and were taking adjuvant endocrine therapy. And if they were at least 18 months out from initial um, start of treatment, entered a structured interruption where they washed out their endocrine therapy. Then they had a period of time when they could get pregnant, carry pregnancy, deliver, breastfeed, and then go back on endocrine therapy. She presented the data from the study um, this past December at San Antonio and uh, publication in New England Journal as well. And in this study, not only is this feasible, people could do this, they got pregnant, they had healthy babies, but they did a very interesting um, comparison to the soft and text data. Again, not a randomized trial, but a very similar patient population treated in a very contemporary way and showed there really was no significant difference in outcome in the people who had the interruption versus those who did not in soft and text. This data has been wonderful for the breast cancer community because finally we have a, a, a paper, a research we can point to and say it's, it's okay for a woman with hormone receptor positive disease to interrupt and to try to get pregnant afterwards. And you know, for our younger patients, this is really life-changing. So you know, we're, we're grateful for that work. And you know, I think if you said, well, what are the most important papers in the past five years in breast cancer, the positive trial is definitely one of them. Yeah, it's you know, it's almost mind-blowing when you think about it. It's like we we were always taught endocrine therapy, you've got to continue it. And it's like here's a cohort of patients you didn't think of exceptionally high risk and you give them a break and they're still going to be fine. So it's a, it's an amazing positive step forward. I know, ter <laughs> terrible pun. I might edit that one out. Moving on, so you predominantly treat hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients. And we've spoken a little bit about the future of targeted therapies and the future of breast cancer with, I guess, ADCs and PSC3 kinase. What is your you know, over the next five years of your research or your clinical life, what do you see is like the next step in the, you can either be adjuvant or maybe we'll say metastatic, which is probably a nicer thing. You know, PSC3 kinase, I think is kind of coming into the fore. Um, or do you see this as like a an, an additive after the CDK4-6 sort of empire sort of recedes and you look at your next line? Where do you see these sorts of drugs slotting in? Well, I, I think... The future of our trials and research is actually going to be increasingly built around ctDNA mm. because we are increasingly able with ctDNA to monitor kinetic mutations and monitor disease status in an incredibly unique way that might allow a much more organized and cerebral selection of therapy for patients. Much of what we do is so empiric. But if a patient progresses on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, you know, which resistance mechanism is at play? Is there an ESR1 mutation? Is there a PIK3CA mutation? Is there, um, you know, a, a FGFR mutation? It, what, what is driving that resistance? And I think our, our vision is we could, you know, check ctDNA and, you know, give them an oral CERD if they have ESR1 or PIK3CA or something else. And being able to very precisely um, match the patient, the, the, the patient's tumor's mutation with the available targeted therapy. And this may extend as well into the adjuvant setting, um, not so much for using ctDNA as like a fancy tumor marker, but instead looking for emergence of mutations. If you could find an ESR mutation in the adjuvant setting, maybe that patient should be on an oral CERD instead of an aromatase inhibitor. So using it to really precisely select the right therapies for patients, I think that's where I, th I think that's where we will be in the next few years. 
Um, that is, of course, an enormously expensive endeavor because these are mm-hmm. not cheap tests. But perhaps with you know better technology, it could become incorporated into um, kind of a framework of how we take care of these patients. Yeah, there's not a cheap test out in Australia to self-fund. <laughs> yeah. A single CT DNA analysis is like three thousand USD, so it's right. like five thousand Australian, right. or maybe four thousand. But it's a uh, not something you can do every couple of months to check the response of, of you know your treatment and those sorts of things. But that's 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 the key to future of oncology, isn't it? Being having a test to tell you what the next best line of therapy is. It makes going through training useless. All you need, all, all you need is a CT. <laughs> the magic CTD. And I'm an oncologist with 30 years' experience. I have a couple of curly questions, if that's okay. Um, I blame my mentor, Professor Lim, for this. And I think that what Elgin was asking, and I will try and paraphrase it nicely, is where do you see the role of the academic researcher in the modern era? of external funding sources. Running a trial costs millions upon hundreds of millions of dollars and it's multi-site and it's intense and it's labour intensive. Where do you see that role? How do you see that evolving over the next 5, 10, 20 years? Well, I, I think when we go to medical conferences and we see data being presented, much of it is coming out of industry-led trials. And these trials are very well run. They are um, well kind of curated and taken care of. Um, but I think that we we have to also preserve space for academic trials that are led by cooperative groups or led by academic investigators in collaboration with industry. There's something unique that a trial designed by academic clinicians who see patients, who understand the questions that we all struggle with in clinic, can put into trial design. I always worry about, you know, where's the patient voice and where's where's the question that really matters to patients and can you preserve that in all trial settings? So I I think that we, you know, really need to keep kind of nurturing the development and training and growth of academic clinicians and, and academic trialists so that our trials are designed by people who understand, you know, what are the most important questions that we face in clinic and not just trials that come from our industry partners. Yeah, it's it's about understanding the value of the trial and the value of the question being asked. Mm -hmm. Do you find in sponsor-led trials it's difficult to dictate the agenda or is it a bit of a balance between clinicians and the, the expectation of the person being like, I want this trial and the, the pharmaceutical company saying, well, this is how we want to run it. Is there a discourse for that? Sponsor trials are typically designed using a steering committee, which is composed of both representatives from the, the industry as well as academic colleagues. And much of the design reflects all of those voices together. Um, you know, there, there may be recommendations from the academic side that might not sit well with the sponsor side, and it's their prerogative not to go with it. But I think that the the dialogue and and discourse and sort of you know trying this and trying that makes a healthier trial, and a trial that perhaps is more pragmatic and reflects the needs of the patients. Um, but you know, we we have somewhat different goals. I mean, I think everyone wants what's best for our, our patient care, but you know, we're really very focused on what result and what what outcome will be most helpful for us in clinic. We're not thinking necessarily about um, you know the the FDA approval and how broad will that be, or when is the patent life up, or you know the things that are of more concern to the sponsor. So you know, people do have different kind of priorities, but I think the the, we, we do have wonderful colleagues who work in, in industry, many of whom used to work with us mm. uh, before they, they moved over. And, um, you know, we have friendships with them and trust and open communication. And I think that that's a, an important piece because when, when one sits at steering committee, it, it, it is a group of, of colleagues and friends working together. Um, and, you know, hopefully that translates into the best possible trial. Different agendas, but the same ultimate goal, I think. Yeah, yeah. That would be the end of my very difficult section. You can blame Professor Lim for that. One final question before we wrap up. 
what do you see the role of immunotherapy in hormone receptor positive breast cancer in the future? Because historically, it hasn't really played a part. You know, it's all been targeted therapy, which is wonderful. But do you see immunotherapy becoming a part of our practice or any potential like upcoming trials that might be changing that paradigm? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, you know, I always feel like in the breast cancer world, particularly when these drugs came out and were so successful in melanoma and lung cancer and kidney cancer, that we were kind of watching a party happen and we weren't invited. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm grateful we can use the drugs for triple negative disease for sure. You know, the efforts in advanced breast cancer have been um, not as helpful and, you know, trials trying to combine IO with chemotherapy for hormone receptor positive disease have not really shown a strong signal of benefit. Um, I, I did recently present data from the PACE trial, which was looking at the question of um, continuation of CDK for six inhibitor beyond progression with a switch in endocrine therapy. And as part of the trial, we actually had a triplet arm of palbociclib, fulvestran, and the um, IO drug avelumab. And in a, this is a small um, arm of a randomized phase two, but there was a signal of activity and it was well tolerated. So it's possible that what we need to do is put together kind of combinations that are not just chemo IO, but um, include other agents as well. Um, most recently, just a few days ago at ESMO, we heard some data from preoperative trials for hormone receptor positive disease, chemo alone or chemo with a checkpoint inhibitor. And um, two trials were presented. In both trials, the addition of the IO improved the path CR rate. Whether that leads to an improvement in event-free survival, we, we're going to need more time. Mm -hmm. But it would be very exciting if there was a role that opened up in the preoperative setting for IO for hormone receptor positive. I think, though, the, the big question and challenge will be, you know, hormone receptor positive disease is very heterogeneous. We've learned this just through like Oncotype. And who would be the patients where you'd want to consider the addition of IO? I don't think it'd be appropriate to give it to everybody. And we know from the triple negative space that although it helps, there are important side effects that mm. can create lifelong problems for people. So how would we ever select the correct both high-risk hormone receptor positive patient, but also a patient whose disease has the right characteristics to be sensitive to IO. So I think that's going to be an exciting area to watch in the years ahead. And oncology just keeps getting more complex. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Dr. Matt, this has been incredible and I could keep asking you so many questions, but I suspect you're a little bit jet lagged. Um, we're currently <laughs> uh, doing this interview in Australia, but I had one final question, if that's okay. If you could give yourself, your younger self, some advice, career, life, oncology, or anything of the above, what would those pearls of wisdom be? Things that you've learned over your years of becoming an incredible clinician, researcher, you know, multiple hats and sort of big trials and sort of pushing the field forward. What are your pearls of wisdom? Well, I, I think if I were, you know, speaking to someone just starting out in their career, um, you know, a very important thing is mentorship and surrounding yourself with people who care about you and care about your success more than their own, mm -hmm. who, who, who find no greater pleasure than seeing their mentee up on a podium or presenting the data and doing everything they can to get their mentee there. Um, and I, you know, had the benefit of working so closely for years with Eric Weiner and I worked with Ann Partridge and um, Nancy Lynn and it just Sarah Tulaney. They're wonderful mentors for me and, and friends and colleagues. And, um, you know, I, I think um, having that kind of relationship with someone who um, you can lean into and, and really has your back is very important for someone just starting out their career. Um, I think also, you know, this is a, a, an academic road is a hard road. There's a lot of work that you need to do. And sometimes that means that you're, you know, working late at night on your computer or you take your child to sports practice and you're working on your computer while they're doing their sports. And that's just kind of part of the field sometimes, mm -hmm. but finding those little nooks and crannies to get a little bit more done, you know, write, write another paper, write a review article, um, you know, write a grant, like there's just a lot to do and figuring out how to balance your life and run your life so you can get those activities done is important. Very sage words, words of <laughs> yeah. wisdom, Erica. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I won't hold you anymore and maybe you'll 
get some get a nap afterwards <laughs> um but look yeah look, thank you again this has been absolutely brilliant well thanks so much for having me and i'm so honored to be on your podcast thanks thank you for listening to this episode of oncology for the inquisitive mind you'll find links to the rest of our episodes on our website inquisitiveonc.com there you will also find a collection of weekly blog posts useful resources as well as links to our twitter and linkedin pages This is Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, a podcast by ADC Productions.